introduce to you uh, your host, uh, Susan Berger. Go ahead, Susan. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm glad to see you here. Um, it's, uh, it's the end of summer, so we're going to begin our fall uh, sessions. I have a few slides, um, and then we'll turn it over to Sarah. Um, if you need disaster assistance, uh, remember there's a 24-hour hotline, and the number is right here. You can always call if you need help from for your um, anything that happens, flooding, fires, uh, whatever. They, they're there to help. And if you have questions concerning the care of your collections, you can post them in the Connecting to Collections Care community um, on the AIC website. And this, uh, there are instructions on our website, connectingtocollections.org, uh, slash discussions for joining that community. You don't have to be a member of the AIC. And we are um, we're there to answer questions. And so by all means, take advantage of that. You can keep up with us on Facebook and Connecting to Collections Care. If you have problems or suggestions, you can contact me. This is my email address. We used to have a listserv. The listserv has gone away. And so you need Facebook or Twitter or to be a member of the community. I also post announcements in a few listers, but we no longer have the C2C the announce list. And coming up the beginning of October, we have a practical book repair. That should be fun. And then we're going to have a course uh, throughout October called Cleaning the Museum with Damage. And if you go to our website and click on the banners, you can sign up or register for those. And now I will turn it over to Sarah, Sarah Quigley. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Sarah Quigley, and I'm the head of collection processing at the Stuart A. Rose Manuscript Archives and Rare Book Library at Emory University. Um, that means that I supervise all processing for both our manuscript collections and our university archives. Um, I work with our curatorial team, our university archivists, and our reference staff to prioritize collections for processing. And I also work um, closely with our accessioning archivists to impose initial control on new acquisitions and do um, some baseline processing. At Emory, we currently have two permanent staff responsible for processing, one of whom is me. And um, we both also do quite a bit of accessioning work. Um, we currently have two visiting archivists devoted to special projects. Um, and I mentioned this really just to emphasize the point that even though Rose Library has a decent sized staff overall, our processing staff is actually really small. And we put a lot of thought into how we can efficiently maximize our productivity when it comes to accessioning and processing and making our collections available. Um, I also taught arrangement and description for two years in the Clayton State University Master of Archival Studies program, and I'm one of three current instructors for SAA's Arrangement and Description Fundamentals Workshop. Um, I'm really pleased and honored to be spending a little bit of time with you today, um, and I hope you'll all learn at least one thing from me while we're together. Um, there are some handouts that Susan has uploaded we're only going to talk about the work plan um, in the next hour. Um, the others, there is a list of resources that you might find helpful. There is a, the work plan template that we use here at the Rose Library, um, as well as two finding aid templates that we use. One is for a collection arranged at the series level, and one is um, for collections with no series at all. Um, it looks like maybe only one of them or one of them got uploaded twice. So they should definitely be different. And if they're not, then we'll figure that out. Um, and then also, I shared two complete finding aids for two collections, um, one with file level arrangement and description and no series, and one with 
series level, um, series and file level arrangement and description. Um, I've provided these really just for your own reference. Um, and if you have any questions about them specifically, then we can um, talk about that at the end. So before we get started, I do have a couple of caveats. One is that this is my first time ever teaching a webinar, so um, I hope that everything will go well and um, that you all will be kind and generous with me. And the second is that I have a cold, <laughs> um, and so I'm going to try not to sneeze um, all, all over this place, but um, if anything does go awry, um, you can direct all negative reviews to the makers of DayQuil. Okay. So let's get started. Oh, hi. That's that's me with plastic clips in my hair. I always forget that I do a hello slide during my introduction. Okay. So our agenda for today, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what my goals are for this webinar. We're going to spend um, about half half an hour on arrangement, half an hour on description, and then I've saved 30 minutes for your questions. There are a whole lot of you registered, um, and I know that um, you will likely have a lot of questions, so I wanted to save plenty of time for us to address those. So my primary goal for this webinar today um, is to give you enough of an overview that you can start to think through processing at your home institution. 90 minutes is hardly any time at all for us to spend on a topic that can easily fill an entire semester. I can't teach you everything that you may need or want to know about archival processing in this time and space, but I think I can teach you how to approach a processing project and to think through the kinds of decisions that you have to make. So we're going to cover a lot, but it's going to be pretty basic, and we may not be able to get as deep into some of the topics or elements that um, as would be ideal. So like I said, I've saved the last half hour for your questions, and I hope that you'll use that time to ask me about anything I didn't cover or about something that I skimmed over quickly and you need more clarity on. Um, I'm also going to put my email up at the end, um, and I sincerely invite you to email me anytime with questions or to bounce around ideas. Um, especially if you're in a small shop and you don't have um, access to a lot of coworkers that you can sort of talk through problems or ideas with. Um, as Susan said, we're monitoring questions. Um, if there's anything that I need to address um, as we go, I'll be happy to do that if you can't hear me or um, don't know a word I use or something. Otherwise, we'll do questions at the end. So what is archival processing? Um, processing is essentially a jargony umbrella term that encompasses both arrangement and description of archival materials. A collection is considered processed when an archivist has imposed enough physical and intellectual control to facilitate access. Um, so that could be minimal processing, that could be item level processing, depending on the circumstances and what you have. Arrangement is the process of organizing materials with respect to their provenance and original order to protect their context and to achieve physical and intellectual control over the materials. When we arrange, we identify intellectual patterns and create matching physical patterns. We can also describe arrangement as the identification of natural aggregations within collections or the imposition of artificial aggregations and the corresponding work of physically organizing those aggregations. Description is the creation of an accurate representation of a unit of archival material by the process of capturing, collating, analyzing, and organizing information that serves to identify archival material and explain the context and record systems that produced it. When we describe, we create a surrogate document that represents the arrangement of a collection and includes biographical information, 
scope and content, and various pieces of administrative information, such as use and access restrictions. The descriptive document is often the user's first access point to the information resource. Arrangement and description are often discussed as sequential functions. First you arrange and then you describe. And even though I'm going to talk about them separately for the most part, um, I want to emphasize in reality arrangement and description happen concurrently. You arrange while you describe or you describe while you arrange. And the most important skill, in my opinion, that any processing archivist can have is the ability to think of these two functions in tandem. So why do we arrange and describe? First, to establish authenticity, to demonstrate that materials are what they say they are by compiling evidence of the origins of the material, the chain of ownership, and the completeness of the collection. Um, also by preserving provenance and original order. We arrange and describe to establish intellectual and physical control. Physical control is the function of tracking the storage of records to ensure that they can be located. This includes arrangement, as well as shelf location, usage, whether in the reading room, on hold for a patron, receiving conservation treatment on exhibition, or any other use being made of the items. Intellectual control is the creation of tools such as catalogs, finding aids, and other guides that enable researchers to locate materials relevant to their interests. Intellectual control also provides a means of identifying um, material with a pointer to where those materials are stored. Physical control ensures that the records are, in fact, where that pointer specifies. We arrange and describe to facilitate access, both for researchers and for ourselves, um, to enable us to find information that we need, then to retrieve it. The job of the archivist in this case is to bridge the gap between the creator and the user. And finally, arrangement and description are sense-making functions. The work of processing enables researchers to understand both the content and the context of the collections in our care. <clears throat> so let's start with arrangement. The two primary principles of arrangement that you're probably already familiar with are provenance and original order. Provenance, sorry, just checking my slides. Um, provenance is the origin or source of something um, or information regarding the origins, custody, and ownership of an item or collection. In practice, the principle of provenance requires us to retain collections as discrete entities. This means that we don't intermingle documents from different creators or different collections. Original order is the organization and sequence of records established by the creator of those records. In practice, this principle dictates the amount of intervention the archivist needs to provide. Professional best practices state that original order should be retained as evidence of the creator's life and use of the collection and to retain original internal relationships between documents and aggregations. These are the most significant principles of arrangement because they protect the context of the collections and the relationships reflected in the documents. Preserving provenance and original order allows us to confidently state that the records are what they purport to be. They're authentic, and the information and evidence they contain is reliable. Another principle of arrangement is that there are levels of arrangement. Um, in archival theory, there are traditionally five. Um, they tend to be hierarchical. The first is the repository level, um, or your institution. The archives and its collecting areas are functional divisions. For the Rose Library, that is university archives and our manuscript collections that we acquire from outside the university. 
The next is collection level, um, or an individual body of records with unique characteristics created by an individual or organization in the course of conducting business. Third is the series level, or the intellectual aggregations of material within a collection, usually according to function, subject, physical form, or filing unit. Um, collections can also have sub-series, which are further divisions of the series within a collection. That is not an official level, according to Oliver Wendell Holmes, whose five levels of arrangement this um, all comes from. Fourth is the file level, or organized units of records used and kept together because of their relationship. And then finally, item level, um, which are individual records or documents. Um, it's easy to sort of visualize these as um, nesting doll toys, um, you know, with the sort of largest on the outside and the smallest on the inside. And on this side, um, slide, I have an example of each of these levels from the Rose Library. So within our university archives, we have a collection of students and academic services records. Within that is a series called General Office Files. Within that is a file called Student Services Staff Meetings. And within that, um, a meeting agenda. The key point that I want to make here is that any level of arrangement from collection to item is acceptable. Um, it is an acceptable level of arrangement to provide for any collection within your holding. Um, not every collection requires the same level of arrangement, and uh, we'll talk a little bit in a minute about how to decide what a collection does require. So there are some things to do before you actually begin physically arranging material within a collection. The first is to conduct some background research, um, then a thorough collection assessment. And I encourage everyone to adopt the use of work plans if you haven't already. I don't know about um, y'all, but I don't know everything about every single collection that we have at the Rose Library. So before I start any project, my first step is to find out um, as much as I can about the creator of that collection, who they were, what they did, why they are important, why we have their materials. Um, you're going to need this information for the finding aid eventually anyway. Um, but who the person was or what the organization did will affect your processing decisions. Um, you're unlikely to arrange a writer's collection the same way you would arrange a photographer's collection that consists mostly of prints and negatives. And so starting with knowing who your creator was and what they did will influence the decisions that you make later. Um, knowing as much as you can know about the creator also enables you to identify the material that you're looking at. So if you know that the creator of the record served on a particular board, then you know what the function of that material in the collection really was, as opposed to them just having um, acquired material by happenstance or it having been um, having originally belonged to someone else in their life. The next and most important step is um, to do a thorough collection assessment. That includes identifying provenance and original order um, first and foremost. So um, provenance should have been documented during the acquisition and the sessioning process. Um, and you should be able to confirm that provenance by reviewing your collection files and comparing them to the physical evidence in the collection. Um, you can ask yourself a number of questions to identify provenance, who created the material, is that the same as the person who donated the material, 
can you trace the custodial history and any physical changes this may have caused to the collection? So if the donor, for example, is the child of the records creator and they um, tried to do some organization of the material themselves before donating, um, that is good information for you to have. It helps you determine what might be original, um, original order and what isn't. To determine original order, um, you can ask yourself if there's an original inventory included with the collection documentation, um, either created by the creator or the donor or the archivist who packed the collection for transfer. Are there original file folders? Are the relationships between documents still identifiable? If there are not file folders, we have one donor who, for reasons I will never probably understand, um, removes all the folders before he sends us stuff. I, he must know that we'll probably replace them. <laughs> um, and so we tend to get boxes from him that are a little bit like an archaeological excavation. You can see in the layers what material belongs together um, and like what likely had been Foldered together in his home office, but it arrives as just sort of a stack of papers in a box. So um, I'll say this a few times. Before you do anything, you want to look at everything, or as much everything as you can. I mentioned earlier that retaining original order retains the creator's original relationship to the material and the relationship between the documents. It's also a critical time saver for archivists. Um, it saves a lot of time spent angsting over arrangement schemes, as well as really labor-intensive tasks like sorting and foldering. But what do you do if there is no original order? Um, sometimes there isn't, or at least there isn't a helpful original order. And I'm not a proponent of original disorder as a useful state. Um, another example from Emory um, is Salman Rushdie, whose papers we also have. Um, once he gave the bulk of his material to us and we processed that material um, and he saw sort of how usable the collection was after that, um, he said that his filing system now is just a box on the floor by his desk. And he, when he's done with a paper or a file, he puts it in a box. And when the box is full, he puts that box in the closet and eventually will send us an addition. So that's technically an original order. Um, but it's not helpful. It's not helpful to our users. It's not particularly helpful for us. Um, and so that is not the kind of original order that I would advocate keeping. However, be very careful to assert that there is no original order. It may be there, um, but not be clear to you. So if there are things like original file folders, I encourage you to be very conscientious about um, dismantling those original files. You can attempt to recreate the original order, but this is only really possible if it's obvious what that order was. Um, the, uh, example I mentioned earlier with the donor who removes all his files before he sends us stuff, all his folders before he sends us stuff. Um, that is a case where original order can be created, but it's not always easy. You can also impose an arrangement scheme that reflects the creator's life and work and makes the material intelligible and accessible to your research, uh, researchers. This is usually based on form, so correspondence, photographs, creative work, et cetera. Um, again, don't do anything that you can't undo until you're confident that you're making a sound decision, um, and then document what you did and why. That's where the work plan comes in handy. Um, the next step of a collection assessment is a condition assessment and um, possibly a physical inventory. So this likely will be done concurrently with determining original order. Um, and in this step, you're asking yourself um, what the physical condition of the collection is 
currently. So how is the collection arranged? Alphabetically, chronologically, not at all. How is the collection housed? In old acidic folders, in new relatively stable folders that maybe you don't have to replace, is everything in an envelope? Um, are there preservation or conservation issues um, that will need to be addressed? Is there mold or water damage, rusty hardware? Did some kind soul think they were being really helpful and put everything in a binder? Um, and then while you're working, uh, create a basic physical inventory of each box. This would be broad in general. Correspondence, minutes, teaching files, drafts of a particular work. Um, we're not talking about an inventory at this point that includes file level transcription or anything like that. This is just um, high level to help you determine what whether you need series and what those series might need to be. It can be as simple as post-its on the box. They're temporary. Eventually, you're going to take them off, um, or a brief list on paper. If you can do this while you're packing the collection for transfer, if that's something that you do, you will save yourself a lot of time. If you can ask your donors to do part of this, then you also will realize some significant time savings. Um, and then if you can do this during a sessioning and not as a separate task, then again, you will have saved yourself quite a bit of time. The next step then is to determine the level of arrangement and description based on what you have learned from the collection, uh, collection assessment. Maybe this is where you stop. This is, at this stage, I, we are at what we would call collection level arrangement, um, and that's part of minimal processing or MPLP. This is baseline, and it is acceptable to stop here. You have a brief inventory of each box, and you know who your creator was, and you can make a finding aid from that. This is the minimum required by professional standards, and the new DAS principles um, which were adopted this year, actually require every collection in an archive to have at least this level of arrangement and description. And this is where I recommend that everyone start. Baseline is better than nothing. And once the collection is accessible, then few statistics can tell you if there's enough demand or if the collection or if the condition of the collection is such to require more arrangement. Um, if there is a need for more granular arrangement, um, your collection is likely large and complex. Um, large and complex collections can um, often be difficult to navigate without additional intervention from an archivist. Collections that lack original order um, often require at least some additional intervention as well. Um, a quick sort into categories, um, a little bit of physical reorganization. It does not have to be at the item level. Collections that have significant preservation issues also may need a more granular level of arrangement because they require some stabilization. Um, one example, um, I can think of one. Um, we don't sleeve all of our photographs, but we do have some guidelines for when we do, and we have a tendency to acquire a lot of them. Um, a lot of photographs, I mean. And um, we re recently got a collection in where every photo was in a yucky old sleeve that the donor had um, put on or the, a dealer had put on when, wherever she acquired it from. And there was mold on everything. Um, and so before I could make that collection available, it had to be cleaned. 
and then everything had to be resleeved, um, and then I could process it and sort of make it available in the reading room. Um, that is not something that I would do with every collection. Um, if access can't effectively be provided at the collection level um, or even at a series level, um, an example of this is audiovisual material. It's really hard to provide significant access to sound and video recordings if you do not have an item level inventory. It can be done, but it's hard. Um, and you know, please don't arrange to the item level unless you absolutely have to. File level is almost always sufficient, um, like I said, with the exception of AV material, which can be more difficult to provide access to. So um, the chart on the screen is um, a quick reference guide to levels of arrangement. And um, this is what we use here to sort of um, how are to guide us in deciding what actions we provide at a given level. So at the collection level, material is often left in its original order. We may rehouse it into a different box. We don't refold our material. Um, we do a quick check for mold and other um, conservation issues. Uh, at the series level, we are often doing more physical rearrangement so that everything that belongs in a particular series is physically together. Again, we're rehousing and checking for conservation issues. Um, and then I'll, I'll let you um, read the rest. I think you'll have access to these slides afterwards. Um, so then the final step is to identify and create the intellectual aggregations. Um, these are groupings which could be series or they could be subseries. They may correlate to the functional areas of a person's life or an organization's business activity. They could be format-based or document particular subjects, interests, or relationships. Um, in institutional or administrative records, these units will often correspond to a administrative offices or business functions. And personal papers units are more likely to correspond to different elements of an individual's personal and professional activity. Um, they may also be based on documentary format, such as photographs or born digital material. When components are, are organized by format, it's generally for preservation purposes and um, to enhance access to material whose format is inherently valuable in itself, like photographs or because the creator maintained them separately. In very large collections, components may be subcategorized to reflect further intellectual divisions of material. And because archival description is hierarchical, uh, archival arrangement and description are hierarchical, each level inherits the characteristic of its parent component. Therefore, if something is true of a series, it must be true for everything in that series, whether it's a subseries or individual files. For example, a series limited to only creative works by a donor may contain different types of writings or artwork, but it should not contain creative works by other individuals. Similarly, if a collection contains material created by a mother and daughter, it would be inappropriate to title the collection the Jane Smith Papers rather than the Jane and Julie Smith Papers or the Jane Smith Family Papers. Um, the most important thing, keep it simple. Um, don't impose a lot of hierarchy that is not necessary. If you have a two linear foot collection, it does not need series ever. Um, that is a collection where um, you can arrange at the file level, you do not need to impose a lot of additional structure on that collection to make it accessible. Volume and complexity are the key decision points in determining the level of arrangement that you really need in a collection. Um, if it's huge or if it's very complex, then series and maybe sub-series are going to be really helpful for researchers to 
navigate through that collection. Um, if it's a large collection, but it's all correspondence, again, a lot of structure and hierarchy is not necessary. Um, so work plans. Um, it can be, or it can seem unnecessary when we're constantly trying to find balance in under-resourced context or when we're on our own um, to do work plans, but they are important and I encourage you to do at least brief ones um, for documentary purposes. Um, they document our decision making, not just for ourselves and our colleagues um, in the present, but also for our future colleagues. I'm sure we all have um, at least one experience where we're looking back at something and asking ourselves why on earth a particular decision was made. And I know that we sometimes get that question from researchers, um, and work plans can help us answer those questions. Um, they can also be really useful tools for communication, particularly if you are um, managing student or volunteer processing assistants. Um, you can make the decisions and then share those decisions um, in a single document that everyone has access to. Um, I think they're also really helpful if you're managing to only process a few hours a week or every couple of weeks to help yourself remember what it is you've decided to do. So this is an example, and hopefully you can read it. It looks very small on my screen. Um, of the work plan that we use here at the Rose Library. We've created one that is flexible enough that it can be used with small collections or large collections. Um, the handout you have is the template. This is one that is filled out. Um, it includes places to record biographical information and um, collection history, the value, uh, research value, and the reason we collected and acquired a particular collection, current state, preservation needs, as well as um, appraisal, anticipated appraisal decisions, and what the proposed arrangement will be. Um, and then if you have theories in a collection, uh, this is this screenshot is not filled out, but then you can do a similar analysis for each series. What level are you processing at? What, how big is it? How much time is it going to take? Who's going to do it? What are your processing decisions? Um, and then at this point, you are ready to move to physical arrangement, which includes um, sorting, actually arranging, and rehousing. So go from something that looks like this to something that looks like that, and then finally to something that looks all beautiful and nice and uh, organized. Sorting is the process of physically putting the material into the aggregations that you identified during your collection assessment. Um, again, you're moving from the broad to the granular. Uh, during a First sort, do not remove materials from their original enclosures or discard anything. The focus here is on identifying and understanding the groups of files, um, not on individual documents or even individual files within a grouping. Um, this could be done concurrently with your collection assessment if you are confident enough to move stuff around. Uh, if additional sorting is required um, into series or subseries, for example, and that happens on a second or third pass through records as you refine your arrangement and description um, and as you have a better understanding of the material and its context. Um, processing often entails regular refinement of categories and groupings as your understanding of a collection increases. And so on your screen, you have a chart of what uh, four levels of sorting in a collection can look like. So you have the collection. In the first sort, you're physically moving material into categories of correspondence, subject files, photographs, administrative records. 
within the correspondence on the second sort, you're moving things into literary correspondence and general correspondence. Um, the third sort is when you would um, be down more at an item level, putting things in alphabetical or chronological order, and then if necessary, any additional arrangement um, in a fourth sort. So physical arrangement then is um, once the entire collection has been sorted into these series, then you can work through the process of refinement that I mentioned until you have discrete units of material that's appropriate for foldering. Um, and then, of course, putting uh, those folders into some kind of an order, alphabetical or chronological or whatever. Um, some elements of minimal processing, uh, no preservation photocopying, um, I think for newspaper clippings in particular, that is less and less necessary. Uh, fax paper, you're probably going to have to do that photocopying whether you want to or not. Um, judicious removal of hardware, I would say only remove it if it's causing damage. Um, not separating material by format, so if a photograph is attached to a letter, leaving the photograph and that letter together and not spending a lot of time housing that photo in a different location, and then avoiding item level arrangement, so not putting documents individually in order. Um, rehousing is your last step. This is a preservation issue. This is not an arrangement issue. Um, this is the sort of final stage to protect your material. Um, make sure the folders are full and the boxes are full. Don't leave extra space um, in either a folder or a box that your material will slump. Um, it will become very difficult to use. Make sure everything is properly supported. Um, Acid-free document cases are not a requirement. Um, on this, in the photo on the left, you see a bunch of uh, page miracle boxes. Um, the macro environment is stable enough that if you don't have or don't need um, more expensive acid-free boxes, you can um, get away with not having them. And then, of course, labeling and numbering your folders and boxes. Okay. I am uh, running short on time. So it may be that some of the description um, we skip. Um, it'll be in the slides. And then, as I said, you can get in touch with me directly if you have any questions. So archival description is focused primarily on aggregates. It's different than bibliographic description because it is mostly concerned with context and is not item uh, focused on individual items. In my opinion, description is the more important function between arrangement and description. If you have to choose between the two, choose description. You can describe a collection's current state, whatever it is. Your goal should be creating access. And if arrangement is preventing you from doing that, then refocus your efforts on describing the collection and making it available. Finding aids are the most common forms of description in archives, but description also refers to accession records, catalog records, inventories and descriptions created by curators, dealers, donors, appraisers, um, anyone involved in the acquisition process. Um, it may be more or less detailed, depending on the level of arrangement, the conditions under which a collection is being arranged, and the level of description that is sufficient to provide meaningful access to users. Um, so often in archives, when our goal is access, we are talking about sufficient. We are not talking about perfect. We are talking about what is the 
um, basic minimal requirement to make something available. Um, the main standard for archival description is describing archives the content, a content standard or DAC. Um, if you're not familiar with it, um, I recommend that you check it out. It's freely available online uh, on SAA's website. Um, and this is the standard that um, outlines the purpose of archival description as well as the principles that support that description and provides guidance for writing the various narrative notes that you find in a finding aid. Um, the principles have been uh, revised. I mentioned that earlier. And I've listed them all here, but I'm not going to read them all. The ones in bold are the ones that I think are the most important. Um, users are the fundamental reason for archival description. Like, we're doing this for a purpose, and that, per that purpose is access. Um, because description privileges intellectual content in context, descriptive rules apply equally to all records, regardless of format or carrier type. Archival description must be clear about what archivists know, what they don't know, and how they know it. We must document and make discoverable the actions that we take on records. Each collection within a repository must have an archival description. An archivist must have a user-driven reason to enhance existing archival description. So if you've started with something um, arranged and described at the collection level, um, basic box inventory, short, brief notes, um, then if you are going to do more to that collection, if you are going to arrange it at the file or item level, then it should be because users are using that collection a lot. Um, this is a chart for um, descriptions of the different levels of description. So at the collection level, for us, we have a record in the Accessions Database, a catalog record in our ILS, and a single um, and an EAD finding aid online. Uh, we've done a general survey of multi-box collections, and that is also listed. Um, at the file level, um, there's collection level records that include description of the creator, the entire scope and contents of the collection, and then more granular description that includes the file level container list, et cetera. So what is the minimum required description um, to make a collection accessible? Like arrangement, description can occur at various levels within the same collection. So it is entirely possible to have a list of file folder titles in one series and only a general um, series level scope and content note and no file listing in another series. Um, that determination is typically based on what you think is important in that collection and where you want to spend your time. Uh, the level of description is generally determined very broadly during the collection assessment that you already have done. But as you process, you may learn something about the creator or the collection that influences your descriptive decisions. Um, certain materials, such as Sound and video recordings, again, often require item level description for access. Other materials, such as newspaper clippings, do not require much description at all due to being commonly available outside of your repository. Um, it may also be prudent to focus descriptive efforts on components of a collection that are reflective of your collecting policies, have high research value, are especially complex or idiosyncratic, or particularly illuminate something important about the creator. Conversely, other components of the collection may receive less description. Uh, the minimum required elements required by DAC are um, mostly what DAC calls identity elements, 
or the units of information that uniquely identify your repository and the collection. The reference code element is the collection's unique identifier. Here we call that a manuscript number. It could be an accessioning number, whatever your collection number is. The name and location of your repository. The title element. Um, which includes a combination of the name of the creator and the type of material in the collection. So generally either papers, records, or collection. The date element, um, which are the dates of creation, uh, the broad date span that the collection documents, um, the extent of the collection, the name of the creator, scope and content, uh, access restrictions, and the languages of the material. So this is an example of um, those elements that were in bold on the previous slide. The creator in this case was Ophelia DeVore Mitchell. The title is the Ophelia DeVore Mitchell Papers. The date element is 1937 to 2010. The collection number is MSS. 1224. You can see the extent here, and then the materials are entirely in English. The conditions governing access element, um, this is an example. This is um, where you would record any information about how or whether patrons can access the entirety or any portion of the collection. So the DeVore Mitchell papers are open for use with the exception that use copies have not been made for all of the audiovisual material in this collection. Um, we require advance notice if patrons want to access AV material that has not been um, digitized. That's how we provide access that our use copies are digital surrogates um, so that we have time to get those items digitized um, in advance of their visit. The scope and content element um, is, I think, the most important of the minimum required element, and that is the note where you explain what the collection includes. Um, a collection level note should apply generally to the entire collection. So you can do more specific theories or even file level scope and content notes if you need to further describe material um, within those aggregations that you've identified. Um, the collection level scope and content notes should describe the primary foci of that collection, including important names, important places, and important topics that are documented in the collection. So this could include um, the names of individuals that were significant correspondents with your creators. Um, it could include the name of organizations where your creator works and for which you have um, records that document that work. Uh, it could include topics that are well documented in the collection because the creator was particularly interested in that topic. We have one, one collection of a man who was a poet, I think, um, but like really obsessed with the Titanic. So we have like a ton of Titanic stuff in his collection, um, which is not necessarily something you would expect. And so not only is there a lot of it and therefore uh, worthy of inclusion in the scope and content note, it's unexpected. And I think um, the unexpected nature also uh, raises it to the level of being important for the scope note. Um, the scope note should also describe any weaknesses, absences, or gaps of coverage in a collection. Uh, for another example, we have the papers of the only female president of the Black Panther Party. Her collection and contains nothing related to the Black Panther Party. Um, and so it is really important to note that uh, so that you're managing researcher expectations. Um, the scope note should also be 
brief. You don't have to write a ton. Um, you'll write more if your collection is bigger. Um, the basic point is that you're creating access to the material and helping researchers to have a general sense of what they're going to find there. Um, it doesn't have to be fully comprehensive. Researchers are, it's okay to require researchers to do some work. Um, so this is this collection level scope note for the Ophelia DeVore Mitchell papers, the example that I have been using so far. It says that it includes correspondence, personal papers, and the records of her business and its various subsidiaries. And I've listed all of them. Um, then after that sort of introductory sentence, I explain just a little bit about what each of those record types document. So correspondence is personal and professional. It includes invitations, greeting cards, business correspondence, et cetera. Personal papers contain her awards and certificates, identification, passport, financial records, et cetera. Her business records consist of administrative records, such as memoranda, agendas, financial records, promotional material, um, such as programs and flyers for products and services. Um, the records document the company's major functions and initiatives, such as her charm school courses, booking models, beauty pageants, cosmetic sales, um, and also document a number of significant staff members and leaders within the organization, and I've listed those. And here is an example of including a weakness, which is there is no significant documentation in the collection about DeVore Mitchell's most famous clients. So she's really known for having represented um, Richard Roundtree, who played Jack, um, and a number of others that I'm forgetting at the moment, but there is no material in the collection that documents her relationships with any of them. There are no, there's no correspondence, no photographs of them, nothing. Um, and then also additional records of her involvement with various professional and political organizations. And that's it. Like, that's the bare minimum that you need to make a collection available. And that's not a lot. You see that most of those elements don't require a ton of work to complete. Um, if you are providing additional um, description, I encourage the following notes. So biographical notes. Um, particularly if you are describing a collection created by someone who is not particularly well known, your biographical note may be the only way that um, patrons know who that person was and that they are definitely the person they're interested in. Um, arrangement and processing notes, related materials notes, if there are any in other institutions, um, custodial history and source notes and appraisal notes. And I'll take just a few minutes to go over a couple of them and then we'll uh, get to questions. So um, biographical notes should include um, the full name of the creator, any name changes or pseudonyms, life dates and places of birth and death, um, family information, um, possibly parents, spouses or partners or children, um, occupations and significant professional achievements, their education, other significant relationships. Um, but be careful to make sure that your biographical note is focused on the context of the collection itself. So um, you may have acquired the collection for one specific uh, element of the creator's life and profession, um, and other elements are not as important. Um, and so you would focus the content of your note on the aspects of their life that influenced your acquisition decision. Um, this is 
an example of a biographical note of um, Elaine Brown, the former um, president of the Black Panthers that I mentioned. I probably mentioned that in here somewhere. I'm not going to read it. Um, but I haven't focused a lot on it because, like I said, we don't have any material related to her work in the party. But we do have a lot of material related to all of this other stuff that she did after she left the Panthers, and um, particularly in the realm of prison reform and a number of nonprofit organizations that she founded um, to advocate in that area. Um, so this is, these are examples of arrangement and processing notes. The arrangement note is really simple and um, just explains the structure of the collection. Um, so it just lists the series. Um, it's different from a processing note. The processing note is where you describe your interventions in the collection. And this is not super common, but I really encourage um, transparency and archival description. It's really important and could really affect the patron's interpretation of a collection to know what was done and by whom. So this note says um, that it was arranged and described at the file level by which archivists um, and that the series arrangement was imposed by us, um, but that the material within files was the creator's original um, order. Um, the same with custodial history notes. Um, this is one area where transparency can be really helpful. Um, the example on the screen actually is from a collection where the creator um, suffered significantly from mental health problems in her late life, and most of her um, papers and personal effects were destroyed um, in one way or another. And so the fact that we have anything at all was very surprising to uh, one particular researcher who wanted to know how on earth we came to have it in the first place. Um, it turns out that it was auctioned in an abandoned um, storage facility auction a number of years ago. And the person who bought it had it for a really long time until they realized what it was that they had. Um, and they sold it to the uh, rare book dealer, Glenn Horowitz, who sold it to us. Um, so that is just one example of the kind of information that you could put in that note that could be really meaningful for your researchers. And then finally, appraisal notes, um, which are, I think, probably even less common than processing notes these days. Um, but we've been using them for a couple of years now, and I think they're also really important for transparency. Um, and in this note, we say which of our curators was responsible for the acquisition and as part of which of our collecting areas. And then we enumerate any um, weeding or appraisal that was done on the material during processing, as well as who made those decisions. Again, I think this is an area where transparency can really transform um, your patron's understanding of the content of the collection. Um, we haven't yet talked about sort of container lists or folder titles, and so just a few really brief tips. Um, the title should reflect your overall arrangement scheme. Um, if you're arranging writings by a single author, for example, start with the title. Um, make sure the first word conveys the content. That's likely how you're going to be alphabetizing those folders. So um, the color purple, comma, draft, not draft, comma, the color purple. Otherwise, in your alphabetized list, everything that starts with draft will end up together, not everything that is about the color purple. Um, avoid abbreviations and spell out acronyms. And we'll end on my most strenuous piece of advice. Never, ever, 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 ever use the word miscellaneous in a title. If you can't describe it, you shouldn't have it. 
Um, and it may mean that you have to do some item level arrangement and description that you did not want to do, um, but miscellaneous is not a helpful term, and I disagree very much with its presence in an archival finding aid. Okay, so I think that's it for what I have prepared. Um, this is my contact information here at the Rose Library. Um, contact me anytime. And I don't see a ton of questions over here in this parking lot yet, but hopefully you have some more because we have 25 minutes. Um, and we can get started with the ones that we have. Susan, do you want me to read these or are you going to read them? I'll read them. Let me see if I can get my scroll bar over here. Um, okay, where are we here? All right. So description is the woo, creation of metadata. Uh, yes, Allison, it is. Um, Sarah Buffington, I hope I'm pronouncing folks' names right. I apologize if I'm not. Maybe you can provide him with folders. It seems like he wants to keep his folders. He lives in Ireland, and he doesn't uh, use email, and he's very hard to get in touch with. Um, I I wish I could provide him with folders sometimes, actually. Um, April Warren, can you give an example of baseline? Um, I don't. I'm not sure what you mean by example. Um, I could give you some titles of collections that you could go and look at, um, but the a collection that is arranged at baseline processing or minimal processing is really um, a very basic box level inventory. So box one contains correspondence, box two contains photographs. You don't say correspondence to who, you don't say photographs of whom or taken by whom. Um, and then a very brief and general scope and content note, um, the very minimal amount necessary to make a collection accessible. If you want to see an example of that, you can go to um, Google Emory Finding Aids. That will take you to our Finding Aids database, and you can look at the Jeffrey Holder papers, Jeffrey Holder and Carmen de Lavalad. Um, it is quite a large collection, but um, we do baseline processing for everything regardless of size until such time as we have evidence that it needs more. and so. Um, even though that collection is large, you can see what baseline looks like in that context. Um, Evelyn Fiddler, if the photos are in an album, do you separate first? No, um, and I almost never do, no matter what. Um, a lot of photo albums are yucky and cause damage, but they are also intentional objects created by the user. Um, and to separate them, I think, damages a lot of original context. If they're really causing a lot of damage or if the photos are releasing from the um, pages, then, yeah, I might just find it. Um, it's more likely that I would in that case and do a little bit extra work to do my best to preserve that intellectual context um, with folder inserts or some photocopying or something, but it's rare. It's something that I think takes up a lot of your time um, and doesn't necessarily get you a lot. Um, at what point do you do appraisal? Um, Evelyn, again, all points. Um, you should be doing appraisal at the initial point of acquisition. Um, if you can, Sometimes it's hard, I acknowledge that, um, but I encourage you not to acquire material that you don't want in the first place. And then 
all throughout processing as you're looking at material on a more granular level than you can do weeding um, or if the collection was not appraised before it was brought in, then during that collection assessment, you can identify larger uh, groups of material that you're not interested in keeping. What is, Allison Young asked, what is the difference between literary and general correspondence? Um, well, in that example, uh, the creator was a writer, and so literary correspondence is correspondence between other writers and the creator, um, and then general correspondence would have been everything else. I don't recommend doing that kind of sorting in correspondence. It's really hard to make those kinds of determinations. Um, it's useful as an example visually to see like what the various levels of a sort can look like. Um, but I think topical subdivisions of correspondence are often not helpful, um, particularly if you're doing something like professional and personal. I mean, if a letter is four paragraphs of professional business and one paragraph of, you know, updates on the family, then what does that, what is that? Um, my opinion is that correspondence is correspondence, and your life is easier if you let it just be that. Evelyn Fiddler asks, how full is too full for a folder? Um, I do not recommend filling a folder beyond the second pre-scored line at the bottom. Um, if your folder, if the front flap will not lay flat, then it's too full. Catherine uh, Collett, Collette. Um, I'm never sure how you reconcile sorting with preserving original order. Well, there are a couple of ways. Um, one is that um, if you are sorting, maybe you're not preserving original order. You know, as I mentioned, sometimes it doesn't exist. And if it doesn't exist, there's nothing to preserve. Um, if you are preserving um, original order, then it is possible that what has happened is uh, boxes have been numbered out of order or material that intellectually belongs together was stored physically in different places in the donor's home. And what you're doing is physically reuniting material that is technically the same. I don't think preserving a disjointed original order is particularly valuable. Um, you can, totally okay, um, but it may be to, um, it may be better for researchers, for your institution, to physically reunite material that has been separated. Uh, Dean DeBolt says you should be comfortable or you should comfortably be able to remove something from a box. That's a good rule of thumb in terms of how much to fill. Yeah, the rule that I tell my students who work with me um, is that if a folder, like a moderately filled folder, if you pull it up, the uh, folders around should be able to support it. That won't work if it's really heavy, um, but it should be full enough that it can support itself if you pull it up out of the box a little bit. Uh, material is not something, and you're not having to, like, wiggle it a lot to get it in and out. If that's the case, then it's too full. Um, a couple of questions. You repeat the name of the description guideline. Describing archives, a content standard, um, otherwise often known as DAC and that you can Google that, but it's also on the Society of American Archivists website. Uh, what kind of cataloging software do you use? At Emory, uh, we catalog special collections material directly in OCLC Connection, and then our um, ILS backend is Alma. Uh, I'm sorry, I've forgotten to mention the last the names of the last couple of people. Uh, Vivian Lee Solek um, says regarding DAX, 
folks should be aware that there's an updated version that will be published by the spring. Um, it's in GitHub. Um, and I think probably if you, oh, on the DAC page on the SAA website, there's a link to it. Catherine Collett, I have 100 plus binders of photographic slides. We accession them with brief information, um, dates, and some, subject, some subjects for each binder. Now I'm going to need to rehouse. Um, the binders are cheap and deteriorating, but they do hold the sheets of slides together in mostly chronological order. Oh, I looked at archival boxes with into, uh, internal ring binders, but they were out of our price range. Well, darn, that was going to be my suggestion. Um, I think you can probably folder them. Um, of course, you know, every sheet of slides from one binder will not fit in one folder, but you should be able to handle that um, in your folder titling. So uh, whatever the slides are of, um, trip to San Francisco, folder one of four, right? And I, I would recommend probably replacing the sheets that they're in. My guess is that they're not um, great, um, but you can get some that are better from Hollinger um, or other, someplace that might be cheaper. Um, Catherine Cornelli, what do you do about saving original containers? Um, I'm sorry, Mark, I'm getting a lot of feedback. No, uh, you sound fine. Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad no one else can hear it. Um, we don't really save original boxes. Um, keeping original folders is fine if you're not, particularly if you decide not to refolder, which I encourage you to do if you don't have to. Um, if we don't save original folders um, if we're if we are refoldering unless there is writing on them, um, and then we handle that a couple of different ways. Um, I have a colleague who photo, uh, photocopies the folder. I think that takes too much time, so I just tuck the original folder in the back of the new folder. Um, Catherine Cornelli again. What database do you use? I don't know what database you're asking about, um, ask again and I'll try to get to it. Kathy Hall, can I get a certification of attention? I don't know what that means. Ask again and I'll try to get to it. Um, Elizabeth Caesar, I'm watching with new interns. Can you explain the difference between papers, records, and collection? Absolutely. Papers are collections uh, created by individuals um, or people. Records are collections created by organizations. And collections are artificially um, created collections. So um, either a donor collected them. We have um, a collection of photographs that were collected by the same individual or your institution collected it. Uh, Gretchen Witt, the term appraisal then is used for research value, not really potential monetary value. Well, it's used for both. Um, I used it here to mean, or to refer to research value, um, because monetary value doesn't really have a lot to do with arrangement and description. Um, if your institution does appraise for monetary value or, um, I mean, we do, we do do, uh, we don't do appraisals ourselves. We can't do that. But we do have materials appraised because we do a lot of purchasing. Uh, and we work with professional appraisers to do that. How do you find linear feet in a collection? Shelby Miller. Uh, the easiest way is that a record center carton is one linear foot. Uh, acid-free document box, 
is half a linear foot. Those measurements are not exact, um, but it is a quick and easy way to calculate. And Yale, I think, has a linear foot calculator uh, on their website somewhere, which you can probably Google. Um, Heather Otis, with archival collections, what is your opinion of removing photos from sticky albums for preservation purposes? Does it outweigh original order principles? Uh, yeah, hopefully my question earlier, or my answer earlier addressed that question enough. I don't think it does, unless it's absolutely necessary. Heidi Sheldon, what about items found in collections? Items that clearly belong together, but that you have no idea where they came from. Uh, I'm the first archivist at my institution. Previously, things were placed in boxes with items of like size, not necessarily from the same donor. Lots of missing paperwork and mystery papers and photos. I'm so sorry, Heidi. That sounds uh, stressful. Um, I think if you can prove that material should be reunited, then you're safe to do that. Um, poor decision making from our past colleagues is not something that we're bound by. Um, and my approach, if it were me, would be to try to do as much as I could um, confidently reunite and save the stickier questions for last. Um, and then work with the other folks in your institution to either try to identify them or provide access to them individually and just be really transparent and honest about the fact that there is um, a custodial history and provenance that you don't have, uh, which is, I think, about the best advice I could provide without knowing more about the specific material. Um, Lindsay Neal, what is your process for scrapbooks that are pasted, uh, photos that are pasted in along with news clippings? Um, I just find scrapbooks even less than I do photographs. Um, even more than photographs, scrapbooks are a particular and unique intellectual object that was created with intention. Um, they're often also in like not great shape. So we're lucky to have a conservation office on, in the building that I can work with to stabilize that material um, and provide appropriate housing. I do remove loose stuff um, and describe it as loose material removed from that scrapbook, but um, my instinct is always to leave them intact. Eve Wayman, how do you put captions with photos? Um, do you mean if I am identifying the photo? Um, if I am identifying the photo and there's no original identification, you can write lightly in pencil in the margins on the back. Um, you can also um, use folder inserts or um, arrange them at the item level, one single photo in a folder, and do the identification in the folder title. Um, Katie Gutman, what do you mean by appraisal specifically? Is that getting rid of unwanted material? Uh, yeah, in part. Um, it's also not acquiring material that you're not interested in in the first place. Lou Charles, what is your suggestion for cleaning books exposed to mold and mildew? I don't have any um, because I'm not a conservator. We um, sometimes if there's just a spot, we'll use like a microfiber cloth to wipe it off. Um, but if we have to have material cleaned, I bring in our conservation staff. I'm sorry, I can't answer that question any better than that. April Warren, what if you have no idea where most of your collection came from? I'm a cataloger, but I'm trying to fill the void at my institution, which goes back to 1884. We have lots of stuff, and it's hard to know where to start in the organization process. Some of our items have a box level inventory. Some have a file level. 
some have none. How do I start? Note that our library is being renovated and everything's in storage. Uh, we'll be moving into a new space in about a year. Are there any basics you recommend we purchase? Um, regarding where you start, I would start with the um, material that has no description um, and get at least basic description for that material. Um, not knowing where most of it came from, I think, is not shouldn't stop you if um, you're in a slightly different situation from the person earlier and have um, at least collections housed together. You can be transparent about the fact that you don't know what the provenance of that material is um, and still describe it and make it available. Um, because my guess is that most of the stuff that you don't know where it came from is actually older than whatever your state abandoned property laws are, so you should be okay without having um, documentation. New space, are there any basics you recommend we purchase? Um, for processing, the real big tables are helpful, um, and you, you want to be able to spread out. I would also, um, if you can, encourage you to have some folio shelving in your processing space so that you can store oversized material um, nearby while you're working on it. Um, yeah, big tables and lots of shelving. Those are my basic recommendations. Alana Donikoff, um, in regards to sorting, what if the material is a mix of documents in the order they were created, like correspondence, photographs, and sheet music? Um, I'm going to assume you mean correspondence, photographs, and sheet music all related to the same thing, like sheet music for a song that was performed, photographs of that performance, and correspondence uh, planning that performance, in which case that is the subject file and everything can stay together. Um, if it's just like loose items in a box, um, I don't know that I would even confidently say that that was the order that they were created in. Um, and, you know, like I said, original disorder is not original order. Um, and so it isn't fun to have to sort at the item level, but sometimes we have to. Um, Jamie Ross, do you have any recommendations for handling legacy collections? We have collections that were processed years or even decades ago with varying levels of description. Many, many of these collections were partially processed and then that processing was abandoned. How would you treat them as new collections, as new collections or handle them somehow differently? Um, I wouldn't handle them at all, probably. I mean, the ones that have, that are partially processed, I might try to finish. Um, but if they have any minimum amount of arrangement and description, you can still make them available and focus your efforts on new collections. Um, outside of trying to provide and impose a minimum amount of arrangement and description, I don't think recon projects are super um, as, as the best use of our time necessarily. If there's something about that collection that is making it hard to use because it's only partially processed and it's getting used a lot, then maybe just do some schedule it for file level processing um, and make those decisions on a case by case basis. Gretchen Witt, if the old folder is aesthetic, would you keep or discard? Um, eventually discard. Um, at, at, if doing baseline processing, I don't know if I would spend a lot of time refoldering. Um, but if I were doing file level arrangement, then I would probably throw them away. And if it was really aesthetic and it had writing on it, then I would copy it and get rid of it. Audrey Lammers, where do you see valuation of books, DVDs to know the historical value? Um, 
there are, to know historical value, I mean, this is a hard one to answer. I'm sorry I'm struggling with it. Um, my experience is dealing with um, appraisers to provide monetary value. I think it's up to you and your institution to determine historical value. Um, I'm not sure that that is worth um, contracting with an outside person to tell you um, unless you're having trouble identifying something, um, in which case there may be subject air expert in your, um, air, in your geographic area. Um, in which case I would reach out to them. Uh, if it documents the topic and period that your institution collects, then it has historical value. Okay. I think that's the last one, and it's only 3.32. So um, again, shoot me an email if you have questions that I didn't get to. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I have really enjoyed the last 90 minutes, and I hope it was helpful. Um, thank you for attending. Okay, it uh, seems as though Susan might be having some issues with her uh, audio, so I apologize for that. Um, but thank you so much, Sarah, for uh, taking the time to go over this with us. And Am I on now? Yes, you're on now. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I will add some links, and I will also add a couple of links to some of our past webinars. There's one on um, objects that are found in archives and how to deal with them. And um, thank you very much. We'll see you October 3rd for basic book repair. And uh, by all means, if you're interested in the housekeeping uh, webinar, I mean, course, do sign up for that. Um, and like all our courses, it has a small fee. And we're still in the discount uh, time. So by all means, check that out. So we'll see you in a month. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, Mike. And um, 